The first particle accelerator, which used this principle, was called the cyclotron. In a cyclotron, we have a charged particle that's sitting in some sort of a fixed magnetic field. It moves in a circular path because of that magnetic field. Well, path radius r and the speed v. And the time to orbit one time around, t, is given by 2 pi r, circumference right, divided by the velocity. The force due to the magnetic field is given by that. And the centripetal force is mv squared over r. If you equate these all together, you're going to find that r over v equals m over eb. And so the time to go around one time is equal to 2 pi times the mass divided by the electric uh, charge times the magnetic field. So let's put a met metallic chamber <coughs> into our magnetic field and split it in two, like so. So this thing will be sitting in a magnet, magnetic field. Sort of put this on its side to see it here. Um, split it in two. Apply a voltage that has a certain frequency, which, which is proportionate to that period, that revolution period. And as the particle passes the gap, it gets, circul it gets accelerated. It's going to go in a slightly larger orbit while you see it here. But the time to go around remains fixed. Okay, it's on a larger radius. And eventually, the orbit gets big enough where the particles leave the machine. But we've done some acceleration. This is the very first cyclotron that was built back in 1931, four and a half inches big. What you see are the two plates, they were called Ds. This is where the particles were injected to the center. And then these two plates across here, the field would alternate, and then we get acceleration across these two points, equivalent to that. Here's a little cartoon of how it would work. So the magnetic field is fixed. You see the voltage on the plates alternating back and forth, switching back and forth at a frequency proportionate to the time <coughs> it takes the particles to go around. They're going to increase in energy and then leave the machine when they reach the maximum energy. Um, for some of the early cyclotrons, this radio frequency or the source of voltage was 1800 volts. That's fairly modest. And you get an incredible 80,000 electron volt particles coming out of that machine. So for 1,800 volts, you get 80,000 volts out. Not too shabby. A series of cyclotrons were built, and really the, the if you will, the um, home base for cyclotron building, excuse me, was the University of California in Berkeley. And this is a group of uh, guys who built one of the later generation ones, the 60-inch cyclotron in Berkeley at the Radiation Lab. This is Ernesto Lawrence. He won the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1939, eight years after he invented the cyclotron. Um, he got the Nobel Prize. And this was his team of people who built and operated these things, including his mom and his brother. In fact, they used some of the cyclotrons to treat cancer. And the very first patient was his mom. His brother, John, was a doctor, and they teamed up to use proton therapy to treat their mom's cancer. Um, I'll probably repeat this later, but this picture <clears throat> actually contains some rather notable people, especially up on the, on the top row. Um, this gentleman here, his name is Robert Wilson. Maybe you've seen the name Robert Wilson on the front door of Fermilab. Founding director of Fermilab was one of Yale Lawrence's students. Um, Robert Oppenheimer, anybody ever heard of him? Sometimes called the father of the nuclear bomb. Theoretical physicist in California, that's him there. Glenn Seaborg, he discovered a bunch of uh, transuranic elements. He was head of the Atomic Energy Commission, Nobel Prize winning chemist. That's him there. Um, the person who discovered antimatter, I think, is sitting right there. Robert Serber, who was uh, notable in the Manhattan Project, is there. A lot of famous people in this picture. All came from the University of California, Berkeley. You saw how we went from <coughs> four and a half inch to 60 inch cyclotron, and that was still a fairly modest energy. Since the entire cyclotron had to be in a magnetic field, the magnets became very large. And as the particles continued to accelerate, their speeds were beginning to get relativistic. They're beginning to approach the speed of light. And thus, it couldn't keep in step with the changing voltage. We certainly started to have a problem. So synchro cyclotrons were invented to try and take these effects into account, as well 
And there were other types of accelerators. There was something called the Betatron, which was invented by Donald Kurz at the University of Illinois in Champaign. There was a the Microtron. But ultimately, there was one particle accelerator, which really was the best of everything when it came to high energy particle beams, and that's called the synchrotron, because it kept stuff in synchrony. And yet, particle accelerator buildings like that tron suffix. So the synchrotron uses a single device to develop an electric field along the direction of motion, and it, op it oscillates at a tunable frequency. So instead of having a fixed frequency oscillator, we can adjust the frequency. And using a series of tunable electromagnets whose, whose strength is adjusted to keep the particles on a circular orbit back to the cavity, we can do acceleration. So basically, we can have a, a, a device or devices to accelerate the particles and the frequency at which they oscillate can vary. It can, it can vary as a function of the particle energy. <coughs> then you have a string of electromagnets. So that field like we saw in the cyclotron. The difference is, as the particles get more energy, they're going to want to bend out. But the magnetic field in those magnets in the circular part becomes more powerful to keep them on the same orbit. We change the frequency of that energy giving device to match the revolution period of the particles. The voltage that's needed is given by this relation. The frequency is still proportional to, or inversely proportional to the revolution period, and that's given by this, as we saw in the cyclotron. And in each revolution, the energy changes by an amount, which is proportional to the charge times the voltage times the sine of some angle. And that angle we're going to call the synchronous phase angle. We don't, the sine wave is generated by this, this device. We're not going to be exactly on the crest. We'll talk about that in a minute why, but usually just below or just, just below or just above on either side of the peak, let's put it that way. So you can imagine we have a particle or some bunch of particles inside of our accelerating cavity. The direction of motion is this way. Our electric field is that way. <coughs> they leave. And you notice we reverse the electric field when the particles aren't in there. When they get back, it continues. So we have a net accelerating field. The magnetic field is slowly increased. The particle will not have enough momentum to keep on the same orbit. So if there's a slight change from where it should be, it's going to come back a little bit later than desired. Well, by setting the synchronous phase angle appropriately, the particle, if it's lagging behind, is going to get more energy than if it were right on time. And that gives the particle more energy, so it's going to get accelerated, so it catches up the next time. Similarly, if a particle has too much energy during one pass, it's going to be in a lower part and get less voltage, and again, sort of slow down to keep up with the rest of the particles. So as the particle speeds up, the frequency of the cavity has to change. It has to stay in sync. That's what we call it a synchrotron. Any questions about this? Crystal clear? You ready for the quiz at the end? Okay. So what frequencies do we need? Let's say that our velocity is about the speed of light, c, and that we have a one meter radius particle accelerator. That's pretty tiny, but we'll do it for our uh, experiment here. So we can go back to our relations and say that the frequency is v over 2 pi r. We're going to get 5 times, 10 to the, 5 times 10 to the 7th oscillations per second, or 50 megahertz. So we use RF cavities and power sources that are about FM radio stations. FM band is from 88 to 108 megahertz. So if you have a um, slightly higher quality, slightly higher bandwidth radio, you could actually be driving around Fairylab and you could hear the particle accelerator broadcasting its signature frequencies. It's about 53 megahertz. 